Hi, and welcome to Introducing the Bible, the program which aims to drag out into the open the central message of a book most of us have seen, most of us own, and most of us know very little about. Most people look at the Bible as a collection of wise sayings with little relevance for the modern world. But this program, for one thing, will demonstrate how it was confronting the issue of royalty versus republicanism almost 3,000 years ago. In this episode, we'll take an in-depth look at the Bible's account of the arrival of the monarchy in Israel and how that played a part in the unfolding of God's epic plan to save humanity. In our last episode, we threaded our way through the books of Joshua and Judges, arriving with the nation of Israel in Canaan, the land God had promised them. But the promised land doesn't live up to its reputation because the people don't live up to the covenant they made with God. The nation of Israel abandoned God in favour of going their own way and so disqualified themselves from enjoying his blessings. What follows is that entire cycle of rebellion, judgment and repentance, with God raising up a judge to save his people and his people going their own way again as soon as the judge is gone. It soon becomes clear the people of Israel will never be able to enjoy the promises of God because their rebellious natures keep on getting in the way. And things go from bad to worse in the time of the final judge, Samuel. When Samuel grew old, he made his sons judges in Israel. The elder son was named Joel and the younger one, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But they did not follow their father's example. They were interested only in making money, so they accepted bribes and did not decide cases honestly. Then all the leaders of Israel met together, went to Samuel in Ramah, and said to him, Look, you are getting old, and your sons don't follow your example. So then appoint a king to rule over us, so that we will have a king as other countries have. The people's request for a king at the beginning of this period is a very interesting one. In an ideal sense, God had said, I am your king, and he was. God ruled over them in the sense that he rescued them, he delivered them from Egypt, he brought them together, he protected them and watched over them, and he was their creator, the one who sustained them, who gives them protection and love and care. But at the same time, there was a provision in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 17, where God talks about a king being given to Israel. But there are conditions. The conditions are that the king had to be an Israelite, he had to be a godly man, and he had to faithfully keep the law. Now, the sad thing about Israel's request, because they did ask for a king, but they asked for it in a way that was inappropriate. Samuel was displeased with their request for a king. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said, Listen to everything the people say to you. You are not the one they have rejected. I am the one they have rejected as their king. Ever since I brought them out of Egypt, they have turned away from me and worshipped other gods. And now they are doing to you what they have always done to me. So then listen to them but give them strict warnings and explain how their kings will mistreat them. Samuel told the people who were asking him for a king everything that the Lord had said to him. This is how your king will treat you, Samuel explained. He will make soldiers of your sons. Some of them will serve in his war chariots, others in his cavalry, and others will run before his chariots. He will make some of them officers in charge of a thousand men and others in charge of fifty men. Your sons will have to plough his fields, harvest his crops, 
and make his weapons and the equipment for his chariots. Your daughters will have to make perfumes for him and work as his cooks and his bakers. He will take your best fields, vineyards and olive groves and give them to his officials. He will take a tenth of your corn and of your grapes for his court officers and other officials. He will take your servants and your best cattle and donkeys and make them work for him. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that time comes, you will complain bitterly because of your king, whom you yourselves chose. But the Lord will not listen to your complaints. They said, and they said it to Samuel, we want a king just like the other nations. Now that's interesting, because God had said, I want you to be different from the other nations. The fact that they'd asked for a king, I don't think was a problem. But the way in which they asked for it was problematic. Samuel was very upset at the people's request. God was too. But God said to Samuel, OK, they're going to have a king. <laughs> and they got a king. So if I can sum up, it's not the fact that they asked for a king. I believe that was always in God's plan. But they asked for it in the wrong way and got a nasty surprise. Well, the first king of Israel was a fellow called Saul, and he was a big, tall, good-looking fellow. So he was a bit of an obvious choice, really. And uh, he started out quite promisingly. He helped people. Uh, you know, they won a few battles, and uh, it all looked like it was going along really well. But in the end, he actually turned out to be a bit of a disaster. Uh, on at least two occasions, he specifically and deliberately disobeyed uh, an instruction that God had given him through uh, the prophet Samuel. And uh, on the second of those occasions, he even started making excuses about it and trying to justify them with the religious motive. And so uh, at the end of the day, I guess you'd have to say he was a failure. He wasn't the sort of king which uh, God wanted, a, a king who would obey God himself. God eventually rejects King Saul and hands the kingdom over to a shepherd boy. That shepherd boy is David. Well, David is described in the Bible as a, as a man after God's own heart. And, uh, and that seems to be uh, the, the clue that we're given. Um, ultimately, in the end, I'm not sure there's a lot of difference between Saul and David when we think about their whole lives. David did some pretty terrible things as well. But uh, David is described as a person, as, as a man after God's own heart. When he's caught in sin, we see him repenting, all these sort of things. But uh, ultimately, he is God's choice, and that's what distinguishes him. David is probably best remembered for his battle against a Philistine warrior, a giant of a man called Goliath. David and Goliath is a classic story of the Old Testament. And for more reasons than just being great entertainment for children, and it is, it's a wonderful story. But you know, the meaning goes far deeper than that. The timing of the story is very important. You see, just before David meets Goliath, the Philistine champion, he's been told by Samuel <laughs> that he's going to be king. At the same time, Saul also runs, has, has been running into problems. Saul and David basically overlap, but, they, but Saul hated David and tried to kill him. But this, this sort of opposition between David and Saul doesn't come, become public, doesn't become prominent until after Goliath gets beaten. You see, Saul's basically a coward. He doesn't go into battle, whereas a king should. A king ought to be there. But this little little lad, David, comes along and David takes on Goliath and, you know, the slingshot and the stones and kills him, chops off his head and brings the head to... And of course, David's a hero. But the real significance is that God says to his people through this story, David's my chosen representative. Saul is on the way out. So David's sort of status in Israel becomes... He just skyrockets. There was a little song that the, the ladies used to sing. And they said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And that got Saul really jealous. And from that point on, there's sort of like a real feuding. And David's life is threatened, but God preserves him. So David and Goliath, to sum up, is a story about God choosing a young man as future king and vindicating him, saying, here's my man. Look what David has done. He's killed the giant Goliath, whereas Saul stood back and did nothing. But David's victory with a simple sling 
is more than just an encouraging story for underdogs. Yeah, the story of David and Goliath is a very exciting one in the Bible. Obviously, you know, we have this uh, very small David versus his eight-foot giant and, and all the rest, and, and there's all the details of the five smooth stones and all these things go to make a terrific story. But it's actually telling us a very profound thing. Uh, we, we're seeing here that uh, God has raised up David to be a saviour of his people. Uh, now, Goliath was the champion of a, of a group called the Philistines, and they were uh, attacking Israel and looked like they were going to take Israel out of the land uh, that God had promised. So they were a major enemy to God's people. And uh, all Israel, we're told, melted in fear before Goliath because he was such a fearsome warrior. David is, is raised up by God to be the champion of Israel, to save Israel. And he does it in a, in a way uh, with the, a slingshot of a stone to the forehead. It can only be God behind it. And so we see here that that David is a saviour figure uh, raised up uh, to save God's people from their enemies. Over and over again, the Bible repeats and develops this image, a single person chosen by God to defeat the enemies of the people of God and lead them into a promised land. David's military campaigns lead to the establishment of the greatest kingdom the nation of Israel has ever known. His borders extended from the Gulf of Aqaba to the Orontes and Euphrates in the north and from the Mediterranean coast to the Transjordan. David also establishes the nation of Israel's most significant capital, Jerusalem, the holy city. Jerusalem dominates a desert plateau high in the hills of Judah, about 50 kilometres east of the Mediterranean. Historians have found references to this city in documents dating back to 1900 BC. Archaeologists believe it may have occupied the same site for a thousand years before that. In ancient times, Jerusalem was also known as Zion, meaning stronghold or citadel, because of its naturally defensible position. The second book of Samuel says its inhabitants boasted that cripples would be able to defend them against David's attempts to capture their stronghold. But David and his soldiers probably used ancient tunnels which fed the city's water supply to mount a surprise attack and overcome defenders. Since that day, the city has become known as the City of David, the City of God. Jerusalem, its very name speaks of its spiritual significance, foundation of peace. It is sacred to three of the world's major religions. Muslims venerate the Dome of the Rock a mosque said to occupy the site where Abraham prepared to offer his son in sacrifice. The Jews pray at the Wailing Wall, the last remnant of the foundations of their once great temple. And Christians pilgrimage from all over the world to the city where Jesus Christ called people to himself and was crucified. Jerusalem is very significant in biblical history because that was the place that God said, I'm going to put my name there. It was originally captured by David and had the name Jebus. And this is when David was sort of on the, establishing himself as king. And he took this city because it was a very strategic city. It was near a spring. It had adequate water supply and was a very, very sound defence. And what happened thereafter was that David made this his capital. Now, this was all in accordance with God's plan because in Jerusalem, the temple was to be built. And ultimately, that temple would be the place where God lived, so to speak. So Jerusalem becomes a focal point for the kingship, you know, the kingdom of God on earth, God's rule, that's where it's centred. And secondly, the central place of Israelite worship, where the temple is or will, or will become. And so it's a very important symbolic site for those two reasons. King David was settled in his palace, and the Lord kept him safe from all his enemies. Then the king said to the prophet Nathan, Here I am living in a house built of cedar, but the ark of God is kept in a tent. Nathan answered, Do whatever you have in mind, because the Lord is with you. But that night the Lord said to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David that I say to him, You are not the one to build a temple for me to live in. From the time I rescued the people of Israel from Egypt until now, I have never lived in a temple. I have travelled round living in a tent. 
In all my travelling with the people of Israel, I have never asked any of the leaders I appointed why they had not built me a temple made of cedar. So tell my servant David that I, the Lord Almighty, say to him, I took you from looking after sheep in the fields and made you the ruler of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have defeated all your enemies as you advanced. I will make you as famous as the greatest leaders in the world. I have chosen a place for my people Israel, and I have settled them there, where they will live without being oppressed any more. Ever since they entered this land, they have been attacked by violent people, but this will not happen again. I promise to keep you safe from all your enemies and to give you descendants. When you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will make one of your sons king and will keep his kingdom strong. He will be the one to build a temple for me and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him as a father punishes his son. But I will not withdraw my support from him as I did from Saul, whom I removed so that you could become king. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. God promised to do three important things for David. God promised to keep David's descendants on the throne and introduce a new age of peace and prosperity. David's son would become the personal embodiment of the people of God and be called the Son of God. God would use one of David's sons to build him a temple. David goes to the prophet Nathan and says, I want to build a temple for God. And uh, the, the reply that he gets from God through Nathan is completely the opposite. David's, uh, God promises, sorry, David, that he will build a house for David. And by a house, he doesn't mean bricks and mortar. He means uh, a dynasty uh, going on. So the promise that uh, God eventually gives is that a son of David will be eternally or forever on the throne of the, of the um, nation of Israel or the people of God. So a son of David will rule over the people of God forever. Now, this is a highly significant promise uh, in terms of the flow of the Bible from, uh, from Abraham onwards. God had promised Abraham that he would have the land, that he would have uh, lots and lots of descendants, and that he would have a tremendous worldwide reputation as a godly man. Now, after Abraham, Moses also received a promise, basically that the same blessing of the, that had been promised to Abraham would belong to God's people, but there was an extra bit, provided they kept the law. God gave the Ten Commandments and the law on Mount Sinai. Moses received it, conveyed it to the people, taught them. Now, where does David fit in? Well, David then comes along and as a godly king in Israel, his responsibility is exactly the same. Obey the law, be obedient to God, set a good example to the people. Moses and Abraham had those same responsibilities. But the specific promise that God made to David was that he would have a son to rule on his throne forever. In other words, God promised David that his rule, his kingdom, would never end. And yet, in order for that to work, David also had to be obedient to the law, had to love God and be devoted to him, just like Abraham, just like Moses. It's like, if you can imagine, a... Uh, a plane taking off and the distance of the plane from the ground as the plane gets higher you know there's more distance and there's a greater amount of space well you can imagine that in the beginning Abraham knew just a little bit about God and then the plane takes off and so more is revealed there's more space as you like for God to fill and so you've got Abraham and Moses and David and David knew more than Abraham and Moses but to that extent too he was also held more accountable. The old cliche, the more you know, the more you'll be held responsible for. We're used to the sight of the royal regalia associated with kings and queens, but in ancient times, crowns weren't the only symbol of a king's authority. When kings were crowned in ancient Israel, the officials would pour oil on their heads as a sign of their new position. God promised his people a special king, 
a man especially anointed by him to rule under his authority. In Hebrew, a Messiah. The prophet Isaiah spoke about a, a suffering servant king in chapters 42 and 49, 50 and 53, classic passages. But the, the important thing there is that this king that the prophets talked about as the Messiah king would be one who would rule gently, have a universal rule, but also would bring salvation to his people. Now, this is a new tack, if you like. Not only is this Messiah king to be He's not to be seen in exclusively a political, economic role at all, but rather his mission is more of a spiritual one. The Bible talks about this particular king delivering people from bondage, healing them of their blindness, deafness, and all of these other illnesses. He was also one who would renew the people's relationship with God and make it stick so that never again would his people disobey him in the same way that they let him down at the time of the, the punishment that God sent on Israel and Judah by destroying the nations. So this king is given an extraordinary job description. He's going to be a universal ruler, but not in the same sense as other rulers. Well, I guess that Israel expected this promise to be fulfilled in, in sort of a, a, a general Norman Schwarzkopf, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a big war warrior hero, and they would have uh, what we would call earthly supremacy, you know, uh, riches and power and great cities and all the rest of it. But when the long-awaited Messiah King finally did arrive, he didn't come in the form the Israelites were expecting. The Jesus video, based on the Gospel of Luke, shows the Jews' shock when it suggested a carpenter of Nazareth could be the long-awaited son of David. Hey, what's happening? What's going on? Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Oh. Jesus! Oh. Jesus! <laughs> Son of David, have mercy on me! What do you want me to do for you? I want to see you again. Then see. Your faith has made you well. I can see. I can see. I can see. The reign of King David, beginning around 1000 BC, ushered in a golden age for the people of Israel. But their model king proved to be tragically human after all. David seduced another man's wife and used his position to have the woman's husband killed. David's fall from grace or his failure um, shows us two things. Firstly, it shows us that even David, the man after God's own heart, was not going to be the one uh, who would ultimately carry the promises of God into the future. Uh, that he was a man uh, like anyone else, that his problems, or the problems of Israel that we've already seen, the problems of rebellion, disobedience against God, uh, are in him as well. And uh, that ultimately uh, he, um, he too would let God down, that he would not be the king uh, that he was supposed to be. The second thing it shows is on the flip side of that is the faithfulness of God to his promises. David was given an unconditional promise uh, that, uh, that would, would be carried out, that a, a descendant of his would be on that throne. And so David's, uh, David's fall from grace shows us that the problem of Israel uh, we've seen in the past is that David's problem. It's the problem of the human heart, but it also shows us that God God's promises will prevail and uh, that he is faithful to them and will carry them on into the future. God doesn't give up. He forgives David's sin, but his kingdom is troubled by rebellion and civil war for the rest of his days. The first true king of Israel, the man after God's own heart, has fallen from a great height. But it remains to be seen whether God will keep his promises to David's descendants, whether they'll remain part of his great plan to save humanity. 
That's the subject of our next episode on Introducing the Bible.